Is belief in the Christian God rational? My name is Dick Herman. I am the uh, campus director for Kyle Christian Fellowship here at Texas State. I appreciate all of you being here. I want to give recognition uh, to a couple other organizations that helped in making this night possible. Also co-sponsoring this night is Icon Church uh, here in San Marcos. And the lead pastor, Dan Matlock's here. Dan, wave your hand. Uh, they were the ones who helped get us in connection with Mr. Cliff Connectly. So we appreciate uh, Icon Church. And also for a connection with the Secular Student Alliance here at Texas State, we were able to get in touch with our speaker, Mr. Matt Dillon. So we appreciate um, these folks helping to make this night possible. What I want to do at this time is first tell you the format for what's going to take place this evening. We did a coin flip just a few moments ago to determine the order in which uh, our debaters will go throughout the course of the evening. Uh, first up will be Mr. Connectly, followed by Mr. Dillahunty, through the course of all of the debate, except for the closing statements in which we will flip that order. Here is uh, the order of the evening. First off, uh, we'll start with an eight-minute opening statement from each of our debaters tonight, in turn, followed by a six-minute rebuttal uh, to those opening statements. Then there will be six minutes for one of the debaters to ask questions of the other, and then reverse the order, and six minutes for the other debater to ask questions. At which point, we'll take just a little break, and uh, we will begin taking questions from you, the audience members. So if you have a question during the course of this evening for Mr. Connectly, for Mr. Dillahunty, or if it's a question that you would like for both of them to answer, uh, you are welcome to ask that. What I ask you to do is this. If you want to write down your question in order to make it very concise, that would be appreciated. I want to ask everyone to keep your questions to no longer than 15 seconds in length, because we want the debaters to get to, uh, to, the, to their, their responses to your question. We're going to designate this front microphone as Mr. Dillahunty's microphone, so if you have a question for him during this portion of the debate, you'll ask it from this microphone, and you can state this question is for Mr. Dillahunty, or this question is for both debaters. The back microphone will be for Mr. Connectly. So you can say this question is for Mr. Connectly, or you can say this question is for both speakers. So I'll give instructions on that as the time comes up. But please keep your questions to 15 seconds. This isn't your time to make a point for you to uh, ramble on. But if you need to write it out in order to help you with that, please feel free to do so during the course of the debate. Following a time of question and answer uh, from the audience, we're going to go to about 8.45, and then we'll give an opportunity for our speakers to have a five-minute closing statement. So that is our format for the evening. So allow me to uh, introduce our speakers for the, for the evening. Mr. Cliff Connectly currently lives in New Canaan, Connecticut, and for the past 30 years, he's traveled to university campuses throughout America, dialoguing with students regarding theological and cultural issues. And much of this is documented on his webpage, givemeananswer.org. And he currently serves as a senior pastor at Grace Community Church there in New Canaan, Connecticut. So let's welcome Mr. Connecticut. Thank you. Mr. Matt Villahunty currently lives in Austin, Texas. And coincidentally, his wife Beth is here, and they celebrated one year of marriage two days ago. So let's give a hand. <laughs> Mr. Bill Hunty is the president of the Atheist Community of Austin. He hosts the live internet radio show Nonprofits Radio, as well as the Austin based public access television show The Atheist Experience. He also travels to America, speaking. <coughs> in formal debates to local secular organizations and university groups like yourself. So let's welcome Mr. Dillon. So gentlemen, with no further ado, uh, each of you will have uh, eight minutes for your opening remarks. 
a lot of people say to me, Cliff, I wish I had your faith. And what they really are saying is, Cliff, I wish you could be so intellectually naive. I wish I could be so intellectually naive to believe all this garbage that you've apparently been able to swallow. But I've got a bit too much on the ball intellectually, and I can't believe in God, I can't believe in Christ. I believe in God, I believe in Christ, because of the evidence. What is the evidence that God exists? First piece of evidence. The Big Bang tells me that the universe is not eternal. There's a beginning. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe has a beginning, therefore the universe has a cause. Not everything has a cause. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe has a beginning, therefore the universe has a cause. If you hear BANG! And I ask you, what caused that? And you say nothing. That's irrational. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. The universe has a beginning, therefore the universe has a cause. Second reason that I believe in God, that God, some type of God exists, is because the evidence of order and design points to a designer. This shirt does not point to a hurricane passing through a cotton field. This shirt points to a tailor who sewed the thing together. A BMW does not point to a hurricane passing through a metal junkyard. It points to a rational mechanic bringing amazing order in a BMW. You do not get the unabridged dictionary from thousands of monkeys banging on typewriters over thousands of years. Instead, you get the unabridged dictionary from an intelligent mind communicating and bringing order. Third piece of evidence for God's existence is DNA. There is more information packed in the DNA of a single cell than there is information packed in 30 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I am not saying that the Encyclopedia Britannica is paper, glue, and ink. It's the information in the Encyclopedia Britannica that points to an intelligent mind. In the same way, it's not the material of DNA that points to an intelligent creator. Instead, it's the information the amount of densely packed information in the DNA of a single cell that points to the existence of some type of God. If you and I are walking up and down the beach, and we come across ripples in the sand, and you ask me, hey Cliff, how did these ripples get here? I'll say, obviously the ocean, the waves, coming up on the sand, coming back, made the ripples. And that's rational. But if as we're walking down the beach, we see in the sand, John loves Mary. And if you ask me, hey man, how'd that get in the air? And I say to you, oh, the waves did it. That's stupid. <laughs> Why? Because densely packed information demands an intelligent mind. There is more information, densely packed information, in the DNA of a single cell there is in the th than there is in three sets of the 30 volume Encyclopedia Britannica. That demands an intelligent mind. Fourth piece of evidence for the existence of God is the innate human drive for meaning. All of my atheist friends are wonderful people. All of my atheist friends have created meaning for their life. But almost none of my atheist friends are willing to live as if that meaning is totally subjective, <coughs> relative. Instead, they attach real meaning to their life. Why? Because obviously you and I as human beings thirst for meaning and purpose in life. Shakespeare wrote, life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. You can't live that out. Because when you grapple with the meaninglessness of life that is intellectually consistent with atheism, you have to grapple with the fact, my life means nothing ultimately. What that means is, I could become like Adolf Hitler, or I could become like Mother Teresa. It ultimately doesn't matter. But you see, you can't live that out. Instead, we, as human beings, insist upon attaching meaning to our lives. Jesus Christ pointed out, you were created by God for a purpose. And that purpose is to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That makes rational sense. It makes so much sense that almost every single one of my atheist friends says, yeah, I think love is probably the most important thing in my life. Very good, my atheist friend. You're on to something. 
Guess what? That love is not just a biological urge. That love is not just a sex drive. That urge is not just a drive to preserve the genetic pool. That urge, that desire, has been placed in you by God. And you know it makes sense because you're so committed to living your life as if there is meaning and purpose to life. Next piece of evidence that God exists is the resurrection, historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I did not make up God. I didn't make up Jesus Christ. Jesus was an historical person who really lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead. The Catholic Church didn't make up Jesus. Dan Brown did not make up Jesus in the Da Vinci Code. No, Jesus was a real person. And we have eyewitness testimony. Matthew, Mark, John, Peter, James were eyewitnesses of this historical Jesus. And they wrote what they saw, and they wrote in the first century. Why? Because Ignatius Bishop of Antioch in 95 AD quotes Matthew, Mark, and Luke in his letters. The fact that he quotes them in his letters in 95 AD shows unequivocally that Jesus obviously lived, that eyewitnesses who saw Jesus obviously wrote about him. Too many people have thought, oh no, the Gospels were written hundreds of years later. One manuscript find, the John Wyland's view. Manuscript in the John Wyland's Museum, Manchester, England, is a fragment of the Gospel of John, chapter 18. And it is dated between 117 and 130 AD, which clearly points us to the fact that the Gospels were written in the first century. This Jesus Christ, we read about as an historical person, lived the type of life that in my best moments, I try to live. Guess what? I fail. I try to live like Jesus. I blow it consistently. If you don't believe me, talk to my wife, my sons. They will verify that. Jesus Christ didn't blow it. He lived it out. And in John chapter 8, he could look into the faces of his enemies and say, which one of you guys can prove me guilty of sin? And his enemies were silent. The apostle John, Jesus' closest friend, lived with him for three years. In 1 John, he writes, in Jesus is no sin. Gosh, that demands my respect. And then when I read the Sermon on the Mount, I see, wow. The ethical teachings of Christ are profound. He's an ethical genius. Then I watch him die on a cross as I read the Gospels. And I see that at the moment's most excruciating pain, instead of cursing his enemies, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And my respect for him grows. But fourthly, and most importantly, not just his lifestyle, not just his teachings, not just the way he died loving and forgiving his enemies, but fourthly, the way he rises from the dead makes us a no-brainer, guys. He is reliable. Now, the reason that the Christian God is so <coughs> rational, the reason that belief in Christian God is so rational, is because as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, we're fools for believing in him. I love that. That means that faith in Christ is, you can falsify it, or you can verify it. Think carefully, examine Christ. I apologize, I'm not going to walk around, I've been sick for a couple days. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, is belief the Christian God rational? This isn't just the question we're here to debate this evening, it's the question that ultimately led to my own atheism. Just over a decade ago, when I was a Bible-believing Christian, I was convinced that the answer was an unequivocal yes, and my goal was to affirm that and share it with the world. Hopefully I can explain in a way that everyone can understand why my mind has changed. First, the fact that we're still debating these claims after thousands of years of debates between both laymen and scholars should demonstrate that the only reasonable answer to this question is no. Can you think of any other category of claim that over thousands of years has not only failed to make any marked improvement in its supporting evidence, but has actually become less credible as we learn more about the universe if we inhabit? It is by definition irrational to believe such a claim. The claims of Christianity were constructed, as the claims of other religions were, to fill the gaps in our knowledge. When we find evidence-based answers, the answer has never been, God did it. And while this should eliminate God as we fill those gaps, instead the specific claims of Christianity and other religions morph chameleon-like to conform with the facts, or the facts are just flatly denied. I don't know precisely what arguments Cliff's going to plan or Cliff plans to offer tonight. Obviously, I wrote that ahead of time. It's, it's likely that we'll hear some version of the cosmological argument, the argument for design, perhaps a little about the anthropic principle, maybe the moral argument. These and other classic arguments for the existence of God have been trotted out time and again. 
They fall in and out of favor, and they're occasionally repackaged in order to obfuscate the fallacies and avoid the classic responses. But let's be honest, this is a prime example of starting with a conclusion and attempting to construct and reconstruct an argument that supports it. The rational mind does not leave the evidence where it would like to end up. It follows the evidence wherever the evidence it leads. I'll try to address these arguments uh, if they're presented and there's time in the format, but it's important to note that even if all of them were valid and sound, and they're not, they would be irrelevant to tonight's question. Those arguments do not and cannot confirm the reasonableness of Christianity. Those same arguments are trotted out by Muslims, pantheists, deists, and apologists of other religions because they at most lead to a generalized God concept that does not confirm anything unique to Christianity. I don't know how familiar any of you are with the Drake equation, but briefly, it's an attempt to estimate how likely, uh, or how many other intelligent species are likely to exist in the universe. And no matter how accurate the Drake equation is, it would be irrational to attempt to use that generalized claim to support the specific claim that there are reptilian aliens masquerading as humans and controlling the world. And yet, time again, I run into Christian apologists who attempt to use these generalized arguments to prop up the specific claims of Christianity. If we're going to address Christianity's rationality, we need to look at the specific claims and the evidence supporting them. Unfortunately, this means that we're talking about analyzing the Bible and historical text to determine if its claims are rational. And as with any ancient source, this is a bit problematic. Some would argue that the Bible's accuracy on mundane claims and, its, and the sincerity of its authors is enough to justify believing its miraculous claims as well. That seems to be the height of irrationality. Cliff and I could each list ten things that we honestly, sincerely believe, but the truth of each of those ten claims is uh, that each of those ten claims are all independent, and our sincerity and our honesty are irrelevant to the truth of those claims. Truth is not impacted in any way by the number of people who believe something, the strength of their convictions, or how long an idea has been popular. What does it mean to say that a claim is rational? Does it mean that we've proved that it's actually true? No. Does it mean that we're absolutely certain? No. Absolute certainty is an irrelevant distraction. When we identify that a claim is rational, all we're saying is that it's met its burden of proof that the evidence for the claim is sufficiently strong that an objective application of reason would conclude that the claim is more probably true than not. You can believe things to varying degrees of certainty, and the rational mind attempts to ensure that the confidence level is proportional to the supporting evidence. Additionally, one's actions tend to be apportioned to one's confidence level. I have more confidence in our new car than our old car, so when push comes to shove, I'm driving the new car. What you say about your beliefs can differ from what your beliefs actually are and even what you're aware of. And I might say, oh, no, no, I have all the confidence in the world in our old car, but the truth comes from what I actually end up doing. All claims are not equal. If you tell me that you saw a cow on the way into this debate, that's a very different claim from telling me that you saw Jesus floating around the campus causing amputated limbs to regrow. One of those claims is ordinary, and the other one is extraordinary. And extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Anecdotal testimonies are not sufficient. When we're trying to re determine how reliable historical documents and claims are, we're in a bit of a sticky situation. Which experts do we trust and why? After all, we can't all be experts, and the study of history often depends on individual historians doing their best to determine how accurate a claim is only to find other historians disagreeing, and absent a time machine, there's no clear path to truth. There are, though, new possibilities. Historian Richard Carrier, for example, is adopting the use of, or advocating the use of Bayes' theorem uh, as a means of determining the historical probability of recorded events. He outlined the case for Bayes' theorem in his book, Proving History, and his next book is going to make use of this method to evaluate the historicity of Jesus. He's going to use Bayes' theorem to evaluate the information from the seriously limited sources that mention Jesus. That said, the existence of an individual is mundane. The existence of the supernatural is not, and no historical account should be considered sufficient on its own to rationally justify extraordinary <coughs> supernatural miraculous claims. I'm not asserting that the supernatural and the miraculous are necessary, necessarily impossible, but until we have reliable confirmation of this type of claim, hearsay evidence cannot be sufficient. We need to first demonstrate that the supernatural is possible before we can determine how probable it is. And then, depending on how probable it is, we can begin to determine what sort of evidence should be sufficient to justify rational belief. It would be irrational to believe the supernatural claims of the Bible based solely on the hearsay claims that would not be sufficient in a court of law, and many of the sources would be excluded as hearsay. 
The burden of proof rests firmly on those who assert that Christianity is reasonable. And if all we're presented with are generalized arguments, hearsay accounts from ancient books, and anecdotal testimony from ancient sources, we simply cannot find that the belief in the Christian God is rational. When we hear a claim, there's a heuristic model that we run through in our head. It's something that we train ourselves to do for our entire lives. Every decision we make and every belief that we hold plays into this. And we ask ourselves questions like, is this claim consistent with reality as I understand it? What's the evidence for this claim? What do I know about the person making this claim? Are they honest? Do they have something to gain? If I accept this claim and I'm wrong, what is the impact to me? If I accept this claim, what current beliefs that I have will I have to change based on this new belief? And is the evidence for those existing beliefs stronger? In which case, it would be irrational to abandon stronger beliefs that are supported by stronger evidence in favor of new beliefs that are supported by weaker evidence. As David Hume taught us, reject the greater miracle. Here's the crux. The Christian God should have an understanding of the burden of proof and the nature of evidence, that he continually fails to supply the sort of evidence that would rationally justify the belief, demonstrates that either this God doesn't exist or isn't willing or capable of providing a rational justification for its existence. In either case, Belief in the Christian God simply is not rational. of issues. We debate issues in science, in politics, in history, in psychology, and I can assure you the fact that we debate an issue says nothing about whether truth exists or not. The fact that we debate an issue is healthy. We're seeking to struggle through what does the evidence point to. And the fact that we debate something doesn't mean that God doesn't exist or that historical facts don't exist. Rather, we're pushing ourselves to think more deeply. What does the evidence point to? Matt says, as knowledge of the universe increases, the God of the gaps shrinks. Good. I'm happy of that, for that fact. But I can promise you, when you read the Bible, you will find no science in the Bible. That's why when Matt says, as science increases and grows, God shrinks, he's wrong. Why? Because science doesn't prove God exists. Science doesn't disprove God exists. God is not a scientific question. God is a philosophical, theological question. Yes, unfortunately, religious people, some Christians included, have tried to use science to prove God's existence. That is intellectually dishonest. Why? Science is based on what you can observe. Can you see God? No. Can I see God? No. Therefore, it's dishonest intellectually to say, I can prove that God exists scientifically, and it's equally dishonest for an atheist to say, I can disprove God exists scientifically. Why? Because you can't observe God, it's impossible to scientifically verify whether God exists, or to scientifically verify that he doesn't exist. Why? Because God is not a scientific question. Now that shouldn't blow any of us out of the water. Why? What are Matt and I doing right now? We're not having a scientific discussion. We're having a philosophical discussion. And if you narrow truth and the search of truth to simply scientific truth, then this debate wouldn't be happening. Matt's not using science. I'm not using science. We're using logic and reason. Guess what? Logic and reason is not science. It's a rational, thoughtful discussion we're having, but it is not a scientific experiment. Matt also says that the Bible, you know, probably isn't accurate. Well, wait a second. I would encourage you to ask yourself, how do you determine the historical accuracy of any document? And I hope you come up with some tests. For myself, I've got four tests that I use on any document that claims to be historical. Internal consistency, literary style, archaeological evidence, and manuscript evidence. If you don't like my test, no problem. Just come up with your own tests that you use to determine whether any book, be it the Bible, be it American history, African history, Asian history, any book is reliable or not historically. Apply those tests to the New Testament Gospels, and I'm convinced if you've got fair tests, they'll pass them with flying colors. Now, listen carefully to Matt. The only reason 
that you cannot accept the Bible as historically reliable is because it contains miracles. And therefore, because it contains miracles, we all know it's false. Baloney. That is a philosophical presupposition of naturalism that Matt is espousing. Philosophically, obviously, if naturalism, the philosophy of naturalism is true, then obviously miracles don't happen. Because you have to have a supernatural God to change a law of nature to cause what you and I call a miracle. Fair enough? So, it's intellectually dishonest to say, well, I can't accept the New Testament because Jesus walks on water. And we all know that it's impossible to walk on water. Yeah, we do know that a high percentage of the time, you walk on water, you'll sink. But if there's a supernatural God who created the laws of nature, who created water in the first place, then it's not irrational to say, wow, this supernatural God performed a miracle. He became a human being, and he walked on water. That is not irrational. Obviously, it's irrational to think that Jesus walked on water if there's no supernatural God. Then obviously, miracles are stupid, really dumb. But that's a philosophical issue. Now, when you read the Gospels, Understand its history. Understand that you better be open to the philosophical position that there's some type of supernatural God, maybe. And then if you allow for that, a miracle is not stupid, it's not irrational, it's the supernatural God who created the natural laws in the first place, changing a natural law, performing what we call a miracle. Now, that said, truth is not determined by the number of people who believe. Very good, we agree. Jesus Christ is not the truth, because a lot of people believe in him. And I can promise you, if you ever asked me, Cliff, why do you believe in Jesus? And I said, well, because a lot of people believe in him. That'd be idiotic. Really stupid. Truth is not determined by majority opinion. You know, at one point in human history, the majority of people thought the earth was flat. Did that make the earth flat? No. Guess what, folks? Just because a bunch of people believe something does not make it true. And that's why those of you here tonight who think that truth is determined by culture could not be more mistaken. I can promise you, just because a lot of people in a culture believe in sute, the burning of a widow after her husband dies, doesn't make it right, doesn't make it good, doesn't make it the thing to do. Truth is not determined by majority opinion. Truth is that which is real. And the challenge for you and me as thinking human beings is to get in touch with what is real. Sure, so apologies for coming off uh, but what I heard was a strong man version of almost everything that I actually said right from the very beginning. Um, he claims that I said the debate shows God doesn't exist. I never, I've never said that. Did I say that? No, what I said was the fact that we've had this debate and had it for so long with no progress could be enough to say that this is not a rational belief. Not that God doesn't exist. If you can't just you can't just straw man what I'm saying when I'm talking about a rational argument, pretend like I said that, oh, we've had a debate, so God doesn't exist. I love debates, I wouldn't be doing a debate. My point wasn't about a debate, it was about the length of time that we have had this same debate making absolutely no headway, and in fact, losing headway. The, uh, the claim that um, uh, God is uh, shrinking and, and the uh, explanation of the universe, well, I'm gonna skip that for a second. When we talk about God, it's funny, Cliff says we can't see God, and yet I have this feeling that Cliff, like most other Christians, believe in a God that actually manifests in reality, because if he doesn't, then there's no point in having this discussion anyway. How did anybody ever come to the understanding or knowledge of the existence of this God if it doesn't manifest in some way in reality. But since we're not talking about science here, we're talking about philosophy. Logic and reason is not science, excuse me, but logic and reason applied to the evidence is in fact science. That's what science is. When you're talking about a God that manifests in reality in some way, we attempt to use science to confirm the historical claims. It is not pouring solutions into beakers, but it is most definitely science. Archaeology, if you go tell an archaeologist that they're not a scientist while they're confirming the events of history, and uh, I think you'll be in for an interesting discussion. Several times there was this uh, portrayal that when I, that I said that something was false, 
when actually what I talked about was it not being true or not being able to demonstrate that it's true. There's a difference between these two things. If you think about it, uh, the example I've used many times is a courtroom analogy. And when somebody's on trial for murder, the fact of the matter is that they are either guilty or innocent. But we don't ask people to evaluate that question. We ask them to evaluate the question of guilt because we understand how to establish the burden of proof. And saying that some, the voting that you think that somebody is not guilty is not the same as claiming they are innocent. And saying that the God of Christianity is not reasonably justified is not the same as saying that God doesn't exist. And saying, as an atheist, I do not believe that God exists is not the same as me asserting no God exists. There's a difference between I do not believe God exists and I believe God does not exist. Those are different claims. And it, we you seem to get a little muddy here in the confusion there. We put talk about, well, why do I believe? Um, he presented his reasons for believing, the classical arguments, which if, if I have time before I get through, I'll, I'll add some quick notes on. But he said he didn't just believe because a bunch of people believe. But the only, the only argument that he presented on behalf of Christianity was the resurrection. Why do you believe the resurrection? Because a bunch of people believed it and reported it. You have no evidence of the resurrection. We have no way to verify this happened. We don't have a time machine. And we are implying, or the, the Christians are implying, that because these people sincerely believed something and reported it and even died for it, that therefore it must be true. That is simply not logical. It is not rational. Reality doesn't work that way. We can say, I have confidence in it, and I kind of think maybe so. I'll tell you this, I love my mother, and uh, I'm friendly with Richard Dawkins. I don't know how many people are familiar with him, brilliant scientist, hardcore atheist. If they both came to me and said, hey, I had this vision of Christopher Hitchens last night, I'm not going to believe either one of them, even though I know them to be trustworthy, even though I know that I would believe that they experienced something and were attempting to relay it, but I cannot establish a causal relationship between what they're proposing, that some god did something, and the actual event. There's no way to link a causal relationship between God and resurrection, other than an argument from ignorance of, well, we have this claim of a resurrection, I'm going to assume that it's true because these people are trustworthy. How could this happen? I don't know. Must be God. That's not the way reason works either. On the classical arguments, the design argument, we recognize design not by complexity. Actually, simplicity is a hallmark of design. We recognize, we recognize design by contrasting it with that which is naturally occurring. It's patently absurd to run around to living things that have a mechanism for reproducing themselves and implying that they're designed in the same way that a building or a bridge or whatever is designed, when all of the evidence for buildings and bridges point to them being designed and no evidence points to them occurring naturally. And in the case of human beings and planets and solar systems, all of the evidence points to them occurring naturally by natural laws, natural rules, no evidence points to them actually being designed. Um, I think there was one more classical argument that I wanted to make sure I was... Oh, this idea about meaning and purpose in life. Um, well, I have 30 seconds. The fact that you think you have a desire for meaning and purpose in your life in some transcendent sense doesn't mean it's actually there. The fact that you have a hunger doesn't mean there's actually food. This is simply a fallacious argument start to finish. When we talk about meaning and purpose in our life, how many of you would like somebody else to pick your major for you? Because that is the type of meaning and purpose that Christianity is claiming you need to have. You have a God-imposed purpose. You have a God-imposed. Wouldn't it be preferable to make your own choice? But your preference doesn't matter to the truth. Now we'll move to the section of the debate where each of the uh, speakers will have the opportunity to ask questions of the other. So for the next six minutes, we have four questions. All right. Matt, thank you so much for being here tonight. You've made the point consistently that you're a rational human being, <coughs> and the reason that you cannot believe in God or the Christian God is because of lack of evidence. So my question is simple. What are you living for? And what is the preponderance of evidence, this overwhelming evidence, that what you are living for is true? Because obviously you said the reason you cannot believe in a Christian God is because of lack of evidence, which clearly implies 
in order for me to live for something or someone, there's got to be an X amount of evidence. So the question is simple. What are you living for? And what's this preponderance of evidence that shows that you, convinces you, that whatever, whatever it is you're living for is true? Whatever it is that I'm living for, what, what shows that it's true, I don't know that it's a truth claim. I don't know that there's anything that could show that it's true or that it actually is true. I think we're talking about a classification error. If I determine what, what I want my life to be, there is no truth to that other than this is what I've determined my life to be. That's exactly the point that I was making, that I don't, I don't have, nor do I see any need for, nor do I see, do I see any actuality of an externally imposed truth, or a meaning, sorry. Okay, but you obviously have decided that something's worth living for. You wouldn't dress the way you sure. do, you wouldn't live your life the way you do. Sure. Now, the reason that you cannot accept God or Jesus Christ is because of lack of evidence. Fine, I understand. But when you say that, you're implying that before I believe something, X amount of evidence has to be produced. So my question remains, what are you living for, and how has X amount of evidence been produced for you to show you that this is true and worthy of you living for it? Um, as I said before, not, not all claims are equal, not all claims require the same amount of evidence. Um, there are some things that, the old, they, they, that are evident unto themselves. I, I am defining that this is my meaning and purpose to life. I am not declaring that it is true in the sense that you're talking about. I, as I said, I don't even think that it can be true. It simply is what I choose to do. Now why? It's because I have seen evidence that living one's life in a certain way is better than living one's life in other ways. <clears throat> that there are actual benefits that make life more enjoyable, more worth living. And what is that? What is what? What is it that you're living for and why are you living for it? Okay. Um, the question remains on the table. I need an I'm answer. I'm living. I am living. Uh, first of all, because I can't help it. But second of all, I continue to live because I have a desire to learn new things and to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. Because I am convinced by evidence that if you live your life believing as many true things as possible and as few false things as possible, you will lead a better life. Uh, we have seen the evidence for this in that people who believe false things are prone to very dramatic errors, like running into traffic. <laughs> Life is generally preferable to death. If you can't agree on that, then we can't even have a discussion about meaning and, and uh, purpose or morality. July 1881, Charles Darwin wrote a letter to a man named Mr. Graham. And in this letter, Charles Darwin writes, in light of the fact that our brains are simply highly developed monkeys' brains, why do we trust our brains to tell us the truth? You seem to be communicating that my rational mind tells me what's worthy of me living for. If you believe that your mind is simply a highly developed monkey's mind, why would you trust the thoughts of a monkey? Why would you trust your own thoughts if that's what you believe, that the rational mind is simply an accidental collection of atoms in a highly developed monkey's brain? Well, I, I don't... The accidental characterization I don't actually agree with, uh, as evolution is not an accidental process. It's guided by natural selection, and that's the reason why things fit their environment and we perceive design. But the, the question of why would I trust this slightly advanced monkey's brain, and it's because I don't, first of all, I mean, we can't ever get around the problem of hard solipsism. I, I can see that right from the kick but we don't need to, because I have the ability, for example, how do I know that this is a bottle of Coke Zero? I can use my senses and I would have to possibly trust them. I disagree with philosophers on whether or not it's properly basic because we know our senses can be fooled and so we seek independent verification from others. And so I learn things by watching others just as monkeys do. And I live my life in the way that seems to be, not as a declaration of absolute truth, but seems to be the best way to enjoy life and be healthy and proceed, just as monkeys do. Okay, and that's my basic problem, your answer. Why? Because you started out by saying, the reason I cannot believe that God exists, and the reason I can't believe in Jesus, is because of lack of rational evidence. But now, when I ask you the question, what are you living for, and what is this preponderance of evidence that supports what you're living for, I get no evidence. I just get, this is what seems to me to be best, this is what I feel like, this is what I choose, fine. But don't you see the intellectual hypocrisy, Matt, of your position? 
You're saying the reason that I can't believe that God exists, that I can't trust in Christ, is because of lack of evidence. Fine, I got no problem with that. But what that implies is, in order for me to trust someone, not to believe it's true, but just to trust someone or something enough to live for it, I've got to have X amount of evidence. Now, I'm waiting, Matt, to hear X amount of evidence for whatever it is you're living for, that it's reliable, it's not going to let you down. Well, I never said it wasn't going to let you down, and you're looking for evidence at a level that is just patently absurd. If you're trying to claim that the resurrection of an individual is a claim that demands evidence that is on par with how do you want to live your life, we're at, we're at an impasse, because I think those are absolutely different category of claims. We're not at, a, at an impasse. So, first question, should anyone accept Christianity as rad? Uh, Christianity. Right? <laughs> no one's asleep, you just lost. Uh, should anyone accept Christianity? <laughs> uh, should anyone accept Christianity as rational and true based on your personal testimonial claims? No. Nobody should believe in Jesus because I have a testimony. Okay. The only reason people should believe in Jesus is to see the evidence points to his reliability. Okay, if, we're, if we can't believe it based on your testimony, why would we believe it based on the testimony of the gospel authors? Because I never saw Jesus, but Matthew, Mark, John, Peter, and James saw Jesus. They are in a much better place to tell you about Jesus than I am. I never saw Jesus, they saw him. <laughs> well, you've never met my dad, but my mom has, and if my mom were to claim, that my dad died and came back, clearly we wouldn't believe her based on just her work. Speak for yourself. But, okay. <laughs> you don't know my mom either, but I mean, would you believe her? If you knew her to be trustworthy, would you believe her wife if she told you that her father died and came back? Man, I can promise you, my brother <coughs> transplants kidneys and livers at the uh, Emory University Hospital in Atlanta. And I can promise you, sir, there are people who have been pronounced medically dead. Yes. And yes. there have been That's resuscitations. Clever, but it's not the same thing as being dead and buried for multiple days and rising bodily and sending to heaven. Good point. We're not going to make, you know, equivocation fallacies here. So, appeals to popularity. The plural of testimonial is not dated. So, just because we happen to have a lot of different claims from trustworthy people, that alone doesn't make the claim believable, does it? In the United States, you can die because an eyewitness saw you murder somebody, they testify in court, and you can die because of it. I can promise you, eyewitness testimony is very important. These students which pay a lot of money really to study history, or true. which is based on eyewitness testimony. It's a legitimate form of knowledge. I didn't say that it wasn't. My question is to whether or not it's rational and true. The fact that somebody claims something in and of itself is not sufficient, correct? Well, you know the answer to that. Obviously, if I claim to be Superman, it doesn't mean I'm Superman. Sure. How do we tell which parts of the Bible are true and literal, and which parts aren't? By studying literary style. If something's parable, you know it's a parable. If it's hyperbole, you know it's hyperbole. If it's historical narrative, you read it as historical narrative. If it's apocalyptic literature, like the book of Revelation, you read it as apocalyptic literature. You know very well you'd flunk out of this institution if you went to biology class and treated it as poetry. And you also know you'd flunk out of this place if you went to English class and treated it as chemistry. You've got to learn to distinguish between literary styles, scientific, historical, poetry, symbolic. How do we tell who's got it right and who's got it wrong? By studying the text, the context, by studying the historical context, by finding out how many eyewitnesses saw this event, in science, by studying whether the experiment works not in just San Marcos, Texas, but also in London, England, or in Calcutta, India. So you have different ways to test whether something is true or not. So is Genesis literal? Like a six-day creation literal? I can promise you, if you study Genesis 1 carefully, you will notice that it is Hebrew poetry. Which okay. means, if you go to a poem with a stopwatch, that's intellectually dishonest. That, you cannot fine. go with a stopwatch to a poem. That, that's fine. I mean, you, you keep promising me things. You can promise me all damn night long. It doesn't have any more effect than testimonials. So, in, in your view, you look at Genesis 1 as poetry. There are others There are others who would disagree with you. And you're saying that they're wrong, which I agree with you. I, think it's, I happen to agree with you on this one. But there are other individuals who believe in a God, the same God you do, 
who are right. in this revelation who disagree with you on the issue of Genesis. So what? what? Okay. What does that? What difference does that make? What the difference that it makes is that this is a book where there are two people who believe many of the same things about it and one thing very, very different. And we have no way to distinguish between the two. Oh, gosh, that's scary. Sir, just because there are different interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran doesn't mean that the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita are not communicating some very clear claims. Mm -hmm. So you better learn to read for yourself. You better not take it from me. You better not take it from Matt. You as a thinking human being better go to the source document, in this case the New Testament Gospels, or Genesis, and read it for yourself. Studying literary style, reading in context, you've got to do your homework, guys. I've got to do my homework. Matt, so, you've got to do your homework. I've done my homework, so why doesn't the Christian God just come down and reveal himself and clarify these issues for us? Because he's God, which means he's not a little toy or plaything that you can jerk around, or I could jerk around. How is it jerking around? to demand the person who wants you to believe something to actually make a demonstration of its truth reasonably and responsibly. Because after he has done exactly that, made a demonstration of his reality responsibly, rationally, and thoughtfully, for someone to say, that's not enough, is a game. It's a game. It's a dishonest game. Intellectually dishonest game. <laughs> it's, so, okay. So because somebody might after God does all this, say, oh, I still don't believe. That's enough of a reason for God to not bother doing it for all the people who sincerely and honestly seek out this sort of evidence and would require this sort of evidence in order to be intellectually and rationally justified. Matt, the overwhelming evidence is that around the world, every culture has some type of belief in God or gods. Your belief system, sir, is a very small group of people who happen to be very white very Western and very enlightened in their thinking. And bearded. Thought my time. No, up. not bearded. <laughs> but very white, very Western. That is where you find atheism. You do not find atheism in South America, in Asia, in Africa. Yep. <laughs> So we'll begin with the front line question for Matt. All right, Matt. Um, you just brought up the, uh, the diversity of beliefs across geolog geographic space and time. Uh, how does that apply to this question? How does? Are you on my side and trying to show for me with an easy one? Is that what this is? Because well, all right, I'll take it, but I don't think it's necessarily fair to drive this to the close. But I think that when you, when you try to claim that it's uh, privileged intellectuals who don't believe in God and backwards people who do, you probably shouldn't raise that in an argument about whether or not Christianity is rational. And Atheist Alliance International would probably debate whether or not you're going to find atheists in this country. It doesn't have any relevance to this at all, is, is the answer to your question. Okay, back to my next question for Cliff. Yeah, Cliff, thank you for this debate, first of all, and thank you, Matt, for coming as well. But as to Cliff, um, can you define the difference between a tran the transcendence, or explain to me the difference between the transcendence and the imaginary? What's the difference between a transcendent God and the imaginary? Yeah, because every time I keep asking this to other religious people, it always comes across as you no know, difference. Well, my understanding of a transcendent God means he is beyond and outside of the universe. He's transcendent. He transcends us. But obviously, Jesus Christ also insisted he's imminent, which means the transcendent God can choose to penetrate space and time and connect with us. The imaginary is the fertile human imagination making something up. So my belief is in a transcendent God who is also imminent, and no, I don't believe in God because I got a fertile imagination. I believe in God because the evidence points to God's existence. All right, thank you. All right, front line is a question for Matt or a question for both? Question for Matt. He cited Ignatius of Antioch. Um, should someone who cites an older bishop or a Christian father in the, in the church, should they fully subscribe to all the beliefs that they're citing? No. 
Did you say I cited it or he cited it? No, 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 I know he cited it. I'm asking if he should fully subscribe to the beliefs that the person um, is referring to. No, that, that's absolutely absurd. absurd. I, I can, I'm pretty sure I can cite Cliff on things that we agree on, um, but that doesn't mean I have to ascribe to everything he's ever said or everything he's ever thought. <coughs> yeah, he's, not, he's not bound to agree with everything every quote said, even if it was what he agreed with. Sure, may not be. That point, a question for Cliff or for both? I have a question for Cliff. If God is real, if God is transcendent or imminent, as you said, um, if, if he's capable of miracles and of interacting with us, why doesn't he heal amputees? Very difficult question. I do not know <laughs> why God chooses to intervene at some points and at, not, at other times. But you see, it's the height of human arrogance for me to tell God when you can intervene and when you can't. Remember, I've got to remember, God is God, and I'm not God. So God has reasons that I don't understand of why he intervenes in situations and why he doesn't intervene in other situations. Thank you for your answer. It does sound a lot like God only intervenes in things that we can explain with other methods. No, let's keep these questions, not make the points. You're asking the questions. It's all right, man. You can make your point. Um, this is a question for both of y'all. Uh, well, it's a good thing we stood up. Yeah. <laughs> what good does it do to make claims to the rationality of an existential question like this? Why can't we just leave it as a matter of faith whether or not we believe in God? Why can't we just leave it as a matter of faith? Um, well, faith, Phil, sorry, I apologize. Cliff and I might have slightly different definitions of faith. That's that's a point of contention amongst many of these discussions. For me, faith is not just trust. Trust is is something that is justified with evidence, and faith is a confidence level that is not supported by evidence. And basically, faith is the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have a good reason. If you have a good reason, and you ask somebody why you believe it, they give you reason. It's the reason why I think Cliff and I try to present reasons and not just appeals to faith. The reason I think we can't just leave it up to faith, and we can, by the way, you're all entitled to believe whatever it is that your conscience dictates, for whatever reason, faith or otherwise. My goal is to go out and talk about these things because, as I mentioned before, it matters to me what's true, and it matters to me what's rationally justified, because we understand already that believing false things and believing things for bad reasons is a bad idea. Every false belief you have in your head potentially opens the door to more false beliefs when you're going through that heuristic dimension. We don't have a choice. We all have to live by faith. You can't guarantee that the earth is not going to start stop spinning tomorrow morning. And guess what? If the earth does stop spinning tomorrow morning, there's nothing any of us can do to get it going again. <coughs> Guess what? You don't take a chemistry kit to the pharmacy to prove that the contents of the bottle are not poison. Rather, you trust that the pharmacist did not put poison in the bottle. Not only that, when you head towards a green light, you trust that the driver headed towards the red light will stop. You see, man, all of us have faith. That's why I asked Matt the question I did. What are you living for, and what's the evidence that what you are living for is true? Notice how Matt dodged the question, was not able to answer it. Why? Because we all have faith. Now, guys, I've been speaking on campuses now for 30 years, and the most intelligent people that I've ever met are some of the professors on these campuses. And I'll never forget a postdoc professor at Columbia University in New York City. After dialoguing with him in his class, in the humanities class, going out of the building, I asked, what are you living for, and what's the evidence? And I really respect this guy. He looked me in the face and said, please don't ask me that question. I like his honesty. You see, tonight, we're all going to put our head on the pillow, and we're going to have to answer the question, what am I living for, because I'm living for something, and what's the evidence that what I'm living for is reliable? Now, for me as a follower of Christ, <laughs> she said 30 seconds, I'm sorry. Yeah, the two were in. I still 
still have 20 seconds? Yeah, I think we started with the clock. So you have 20 seconds. 20 seconds. All right. Oh, oh man, I wish I had that 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Matt, you take it if you want it. Go ahead. No, I, we just have different definitions of me. We sure do. <laughs> I am convinced that faith involves two things. Evidence of reliability. I refuse to trust you unless there's evidence that you're trustworthy. So faith, good faith is evidence, not proof. I can't prove you. Evidence of reliability plus commitment. I flew down here on a hook of metal. Time's up. <laughs> Okay. Uh, for people who don't get a chance to hear about Christianity or Jesus or any of that, what happens to them? Like, do they deserve the eternal hellfire that apparently awaits them if they don't accept Jesus? Because that's the only thing that I really have an issue wrapping my mind around. Good question. I do not know specifically how God will judge those who never heard about Christ, because Christ never specifically addresses the question. So obviously if I were to answer you, I'd be making it up. But I can you tell you that Jesus promises that God's character is just, which means nobody's going to get ripped off. All would be judged fairly. Second point, I can promise you that nobody goes to hell because they haven't heard about Jesus. Nobody. The only reason people go to hell is because they choose to live their life separate from God, and because God respects our free will, he's not going to haul us into heaven against our will. Why do we not want to go to heaven? Because that's where God is. And some of us do not want to live together with God. And God says, guess what? I respect your free will. So you're not going to spend eternity with me in heaven. You'll spend eternity separate from me. He defines that as hell. Third point, sir. I do know that a truckload of people are going to be in heaven who never heard about Jesus. Hebrews chapter 11 lists some of these people. Clearly, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, a Gentile prostitute. Obviously, they never heard about Jesus. They were born hundreds, if not thousands of years before Jesus. But in humility, they put their faith in God. They're going to be in heaven, the Bible promises. Not only that, fourth point is that the only reason any of us are going to be in heaven, including Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, is not because we all are great people. At times, we all do great things. All of my atheist friends at times do great things. All of my Christian and Buddhist friends at times do great things. But we all also blow it. We sin. We rebel against God. So the only reason any of us are going to be in heaven is because God loves us so much that he sent his only son Christ to bleed and die on a cross to forgive us and to give us the gift of eternal life. And fifthly, although I do not know how God will judge those who never heard about Christ, as I told you at the beginning, I do know that all of us here have the opportunity to read the Gospels. We are responsible for what we do with Jesus. But I can assure you, God judges us on what we know, not on what we don't know. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Um, one thing I've struggled with is the fact that there are so many religions in the world claiming to be correct. So for Cliff, uh, I ask you, what makes the Bible a more credible source than all those other religious texts? And for Matt, I ask you, why is it more credible? Why isn't, what? Why isn't the Bible more credible than any other text? Oh, I'm sure I'm a person. Um, why isn't the Bible more credible than any other religious book? I don't know whether it is or not. My issue with it isn't whether or not it's more credible or less credible than some other text. It's, is it true? Is it real? I mean, when you look at what was actually discussed tonight, apart from the classic argument of Jesus and God, which you can look up online, or at ironchariots.org, the wiki that I run that has counter apologetics on it. Um, oh, it's <laughs> but anyway, uh, you can find the, the, those there. The only thing that was really offered tonight was the resurrection. Cliff finds the description of the resurrection plausible. I do not. It doesn't matter if the whole rest of the Bible was something that I found more plausible than the Quran. Just like it doesn't matter that I find my mom or Richard Dawkins to be eminently truthful in all sorts of things. It doesn't mean that because they have had some experience or relay some experience that I have to or should find it plausible. Um, I think there could be arguments made that the textual reliability of the Quran is better than that of the Bible. That doesn't actually speak to the content so much as the history of its transcription. Um, so I can't, I don't even know that I would make a statement as to which one is more reliable. I, I, I think we can look at some things and say they're more absurd than others. And I apologize, by the way, in advance, uh, or late, if it's too late, 
uh, if I offend anybody on behalf of their religious beliefs, but I do speak frankly. And uh, we had a discussion the other day about whether or not Mormonism is you know, more absurd than Christianity. I think you have to say that it is, because it's Christianity plus this. So if Christianity is this absurd, Mormonism necessarily needs to be more absurd. Um, I think you can look at a lot of things that way, but at the end of the day, which one's more reliable or more absurd doesn't make as much difference to me as which one is most likely true, and how do we know? Thank you. Um, and Cliff, you're obviously speaking for Christianity and not for other religions, so what makes it more <coughs> You bet. I am not asking anybody to accept the Bible as more credible than the Quran. Why? Because it's impossible to prove that any book is the word of God. So I wouldn't want to waste my time or your time trying. Now, when you study historicity, remember the four tests that I've used. Internal consistency, literary style, archaeological evidence, and manuscript evidence. And we'll be out there again at noon by the horse, horses of free speech area. And that issue, I'm sure, will be raised again. And we'll go over those four tests again. If you don't like those tests, no problem. Come up with your own tests. But when I use those four tests, Internal consistency, meaning are there contradictions or not in the text? Literary style, what's the literary genre? Archaeological evidence and manuscript evidence, guess what? The Quran is very accurate. Guess what? The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are very accurate. So simply read the Quran as the accurate book it is and ask yourself, does the evidence of the way Muhammad lived his life what he taught, how he treated people, how he died, and what happened after he died, does that point to Muhammad being trustworthy, reliable? And then read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and ask yourself the same question. Does the evidence of the way Jesus lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead point to his credibility, or does it not? Now, I happen to have a great deal of respect for Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. Why? Because the guy grew up in a very wealthy home. He escaped that home, he saw a suffering man, he saw a dying man, and he began to realize, guess what? The purpose of my life had better be bigger than just how cushy an existence could I live. I better begin to grapple with the problem of suffering. Now when you examine Siddhartha Gautama's Buddha's solution to the problem of suffering, which is cut off your desires, I think that's a very sad conclusion that he makes. But to argue that Siddhartha Gautama Buddha is a fantasy, is a joke, he's an historical person, as is Mohammed, as is Jesus. Thank you. So that one is a clip, uh, question for Cliff or for Cliff question. Okay. Uh, Cliff, I noticed that your analogies about evolution are either misled or dishonest because they ignore natural selection whereby information is saved and built upon over time. Uh, so you better believe that if you put a uh, group of monkeys... Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if, if you put a group of monkeys in a room and have them type and the good keys were saved and the other ones were dismissed, that they would type roomfuls of dictionaries over, uh, over millions of years. So do you not understand natural selection or did you instruct those to mislead other people who don't understand natural selection? I'm sorry, I've miscommunicated, uh, because you've totally misunderstood my point. I believe in evolution as a process. Okay, let's say it again. I believe in evolution as a process, as does Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project. All right? But I do not accept evolution as an origin. Evolution as an origin is a philosophy, and that philosophy is that you and I come from natural selection. Well, what is natural selection? Chance, mutations, natural selection, chance, and fate. And I, that's a philosophical position, but I am convinced that that philosophical position is erroneous. Why? Because every time that I'm confronted by life, I notice it comes from life. I never see life come from non-life. But evolution as an origin, not as a process, but evolution as an origin is a belief and it's a wild belief that life comes from non-life. In my experience of reality, the rational comes from the non-rational. From the rational, the rational never comes from the non-rational. But an atheist is someone who says, I believe the rational mind comes from the non-rational. I'm sorry, there's nothing in my observation of life that supports that. 
So, I believe in evolution as a process, but not as an origin. Little family mice lived in a piano. They enjoyed the music that came from the great piano player, until one day one of the little mice climbed up even into the bowels of the piano, and they found out, guess what? The music doesn't come from a piano player. The music comes from wires that reverberate back and forth. When he came back to his family of mice, they refused to believe in a great piano player because they had a totally mechanistic understanding of the universe. The music is produced by wires. Until one of the little mice got even braver, found out that it's the hammers that really produce the music. No, it's the great piano player. Just because you understand the mechanics doesn't mean that there's not a mind behind it. That's all I'm saying. And let me also mention, obviously two minutes isn't a lot of time to give a for response to your questions, so I know both of these guys would be willing to uh, dialogue with you further at the conclusion of tonight, so feel free to talk with them. Front mic, question for Matt or for Doug? Matt, what's your name? Matt. Matt, okay. Um, <laughs> Well, confirmed evidence for one thing. Um, the, when, I, when I say they're not making any progress, they're making backwards progress. I'm talking about, Cliff, Cliff pointed out, we talked about Genesis, that it's poetic. But it didn't used to be considered poetic by almost anybody. It used to be considered pretty literal. And it changed from being literal to poetic, coincidentally, when we learned more about the universe. And therefore, there was a slightly smaller space to fit God into. When we learn about things like evolution, for example, which I agree with Cliff, that knowing the mechanics of evolution does not mean that there's not a mind behind it. But one of the, one of the mistakes that Cliff had made earlier was confusing philosophical naturalism with methodological naturalism. Philosophical naturalism is the assertion that there's nothing but the natural world. Methodological naturalism is what science relies on. And what it says is, we don't know whether or not there's anything beyond this natural world, but we can't say anything about it, so we don't get to appeal to it as solutions. That's where science departs from religion, because religion gets to appeal to it, even when it doesn't make sense to do so. Even when we have an understanding... Uh, did I call you Phil again? You can call me whatever you want. It's Cliff. <laughs> At least I have faith that it's Cliff. <laughs> Great point. Actually, I don't, but I don't have time to get into it. Anyway, <laughs> when I talk about not making progress, it's about the, all of the claims that Christianity makes. When we go and investigate them, the supernatural claims, we never come up with a supernatural answer. That is, that is a little bit, a little bit unfair because science is bound and can't assert these supernatural answers. But what it means is that we cannot be rationally justified in appealing to the supernatural as an explanation. God is not an explanation for anything. God has no explanatory power. You cannot solve a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. All right, let me answer quickly. Okay. All right? Is this the ball? Yeah, well, oh, it wasn't when you asked. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, I actually didn't talk about it again. <laughs> all right, Matt just made a classic blunder. His statement was, and you all heard him, I heard it real clearly, it used to be thought that God created in six 24-hour periods. But Cliff has changed things because he realizes that science has shown that... I didn't say you changed it. Yeah, that's right, but you made your point very clearly, Matt, that because of the intimidation of evolution and science, Christians have had to change their opinion. He could not be more mistaken. Why? Because in the 300s and 400s, a man named Augustine, a brilliant thinker, pointed out that Genesis 1 is not talking about six 24-hour periods, because when is the sun created? <coughs> On the fourth day. And if you don't have a sun the first three days, you don't have a way to measure 24 hours. And one of Augustine's main points, without ever hearing about Charles Darwin, without ever hearing about evolution, was, guess what? It is intellectually dishonest to go to Genesis 1 and say it demands 
believing that God created in six 24-hour periods. Augustine made that claim back at the end of the 300s in the early 400s, long before science, modern science, was developed. So this idea that Christians have just changed things and that I've just changed things is bogus. I go right back to Augustine, late 300s, early 400s, who insisted that Genesis is not talking about six 24-hour periods. But obviously, Genesis is not answering the question, exactly how long did God take to create? Augustine's logic was flawed because you could have 24 hours. It was basically saying that God couldn't measure 24 hours. At this time, the idea, there was nobody there to witness this, so it was all directed from God, which means God could claim whatever he wanted, and God could know what 24 hours was even before that. This was changed, and it was not universally accepted. There were still people who considered it. There were still people who David considered it. Now you're sounding like my conservative Christian fundamentalist friends. <laughs> All right, on to the next question. Back to my question. Question for Cliff or both? Just a quick question for Cliff. Um, earlier you said this is a philosophical debate and not, not a scientific one. Right. But in the beginning, one of your main examples that God exists was the Big Bang Theory. That has to be something in the beginning to start. You brought a scientific theory into a debate about philosophy. How do you justify that? Very simply. I used a scientific theory, the Big Bang, which, by the way, could be disproven in 50 years or less, right? But at this point, the Big Bang is highly accepted. But I was not using a scientific proof that God exists. I was using a philosophical argument, which is this. Everything that has a beginning, not everything, but everything that has a beginning has a cause. Because the universe has a beginning, the universe has a cause. Sir, that is not a scientific argument. That is a philosophical <coughs> argument. Now, when I talk about the ductus arteriosus, that little flap of skin in all of us that went down when we were born, prevented us from Saul suffocating, and it rerouted the blood from going from the heart to the extremities, it rerouted the blood to go from the heart to the lungs, so that it could not be oxygenated to the extremities. I'm not saying that proves God. No. What I'm saying is a philosophical thing that that amazing intricate design demands an intelligent mind. When I say 21% of this atmosphere is comprised of oxygen, if it was 25%, fires would break out all over the place, we'd burn. If it was 15%, oxygen in our atmosphere would all suffocate. That doesn't mean that that proves God. But what it means is life is balanced on a razor's edge. Now, is it more reasonable to believe that that degree of balance, of intricate design, comes from chance? Or is it more reasonable to believe that that kind of intricate design comes from rational being? <coughs> For me, that's a no-brainer. But that's a philosophical argument. It's not saying, because the atmosphere is comprised of 21% oxygen, that proves that God exists. That'd be stupid. It doesn't at all. Does that make any sense? Thank you, sir, for raising that. Sure. First of all, I think created is the wrong term um, because I think it's a cheat. 
I think that I have heard a dozen apologists in the last couple of months say, creation demands a creator. Well, yeah, it does if you label it that way. But it's not creation. It's reality. And reality doesn't demand a reality creator. Uh, I believe that the best explanation, based on all the information we have, is that I am the latest in a stream of organisms that are self-replicating, that the process of which is defined by evolution and natural selection. Um, Cliff brought up Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project, who has said that even without fossil evidence, common ancestry would be assured by DNA evidence alone. So Collins already accepts this idea of common ancestry. Um, where, where he and Cliff depart on chance, I don't know. Uh, but evolution doesn't describe the origin of life. That's a separate issue. That's abiogenesis. And that's somewhere that we don't currently have a good answer. But we're making progress. We have uh, individuals like uh, John Oro and others who have been experimenting in the lab and demonstrating the basic building blocks of amino, uh, of life, amino acids and such can come from non-living materials. We know how it happened, though. Uh, do, we, do we know whether it was panspermia, you know, something you know, life was somewhere else and planted here with an asteroid? Do we think it happened in the primordial ooze at the bottom of the sea? We don't know. But it's okay to say we don't know because saying we don't know means that we get to go look for the real answer if instead we say, wow, I just don't see how that could possibly happen without some god tinkering with it, now we have crippled progress. We have inhibited ourselves and locked ourselves into an explanation that we can never prove, never justify, and it stops some people, thankfully not all, from going out and finding out what the real answers are. When we find out the real answers, Do you have it's... The real answer? when, we, no, I don't. when we find the real answer, it has yet to be gotten. Okay, that's our two minutes now. This is the same question for Cliff, or do you want to rephrase it? You bet. I love the first part of your question. Do you believe in history? In other words, do you trust your mind to tell you the truth? I was at Columbia University in New York City, dialoguing with the students, and all of a sudden this Columbia student stepped out of the crowd and said, Cliff, how do you know? that your brain was not just created this morning in a big vat by a very intelligent scientist. How do you know that all of your memories that you have of the past was not placed in your brain by that very intelligent scientist? I thought the dude was playing games with me. All right? Until I learned afterwards that that was exactly what they were discussing in humanities class at Columbia University. Then I spoke at the University of Texas, Austin. And I got into a dialogue with several of the professors, the philosophy professors. And the atheist philosophy professors were honestly struggling through the issue, and I respect them highly for their intellectual honesty, of why do we trust our minds to tell us the truth about reality? But then there was a Christian philosophy professor at UT Austin who said, you see guys, I don't have to waste my time struggling through the question why should I trust this accidental collection of atoms to tell me the truth about reality? Instead, because I am convinced that there's a rational God who created us with rational minds that enable us to understand reality, I can go on and struggle through different philosophical questions. But I respect my atheist philosophy professor friends, my associates, who are realizing that if there is no God, there is no good reason to trust your rational mind. That is the epistemological nihilism, which is just a fancy way of saying, guys, why do you trust your mind to tell you anything about reality? That's the struggle for, an honest struggle for an atheist. Yeah. 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 Okay, but at the uh, onset of your introduction here, you said that uh, world based tenets of being able to prove that the belief in Christian God is rational uh, is the story of the resurrection itself. Now, given that there is no actual testimony of seeing the resurrection itself, as well as there not being any body, and that currently we do not find the absence of evidence to be evidence in and of itself, what further evidence can you provide that Jesus was in fact resurrected? Well, first of all, we have to establish did the dude really die? And in the Gospel of John, we read that a Roman soldier took a spear, jammed it in the side of Christ, 
and watery serum separate from clotted blood flowed from the side of Christ. They didn't understand that medically in the first century. He just wrote what he saw. And, but we understand medically today that if you have a major incision in your chest and watery serum flows out separate from clotted blood, it's a sign of massive heart failure. You're dead, friend. Stone dead. They take the body of Christ off the cross. They don't bury it in a hidden tomb. They bury it in a very well-known tomb. The tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Who was that guy? He was part of the Sanhedrin, one of the leaders of the Jewish nation. So this is not some secret place, some unknown tomb. He's buried in a very well-known tomb. Now, what about his true believing followers? What about those glassy, mesmerized fanatics called Peter, James, John, Matthew? They were confident he was going to rise from the dead because he promised to, right? No, wrong. They all dispersed in disillusionment. His bravest follower, the apostle Peter, denied knowing him three times. When he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, all of his disciples deserted him. They were not expecting to see a resurrected Christ. They were Christ deniers, Christ betrayers, Christ deserters. Three days after he rises from the dead, he appears, first of all, to some grief-torn women. Now, sir, women in first century Palestinian culture were not allowed to testify in court. That's how bad the sexism was. But Christ attacks the sexism of his day, appearing first risen from the dead to some grief-torn woman. Then over a period of 40 days, he appears to over 500 people. So the evidence is, he really died, he was really buried, and he really rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, written, early 50s AD, 20 years after the fact, talks about the resurrection. Before we go to the next question, uh, in order for us to stay on schedule and allow these guys to have their closing arguments, it must be completed by nine. I'm not a mathematician, but I know we're going to have time to take all these questions, so I'll apologize in advance. So, just to you know. Uh, my question for Matt, first of all. Um, I have a question for Matt. Um, you know, Matt, you were talking about the Jewish people being Okay, so quickly, um, I think you can prove love. <coughs> I think you have to be able to prove love. We recognize it. Love is a label that we put on a bunch of interactions. Yes, there's chemical stuff going on in the brain, and whether or not you think that there's God causing chemical stuff in the brain or not is irrelevant to the actual subjective experience of being in love. We're actually really good at identifying love of different kinds. We are so good at it, by the way, that new mothers that are holding a baby or where the new mother is suffering from depression and other disorders, they don't demonstrate the types of actions that show real love to that baby that we've seen from other people. And so we can recognize this to some degree. It is a label that we put on a whole collection of human interactions. I love my wife. We had our anniversary uh, two days ago. Uh, <laughs> The evidence of this is experiential for me and for other people to be able to recognize that they see how we act together. Is it possible we could be faking it? Yes. But this goes back to whether or not absolute certainty is required to be confident in something. And it's not. Absolute certainty is a red herring. Outside of uh, the logical absolutes and esoteric claims and labels, we can't be absolutely certain about anything. I can't be absolutely certain that I'm not a brain in a bat. But it doesn't make any difference to me right now whether I am. You know, it's just like you can't prove that I'm not in the matrix. But it doesn't make any difference to me right now because I am stuck dealing with the reality that I actually experience on that reality's terms. And so it's in my best interest to get to know and understand that reality. So when it comes to love, we can, we can actually measure people's emotions with EEG. So I don't, I don't agree that you can't measure uh, there was a second part to the question. I only have five seconds. Oh, it was talking about irrational love because you were saying that things need plausible explanation. Yeah, I think it, it, wow, it's way too complex for this, but um, there are things that we do in, in our own best interest, and there are there's flawed thinking. We all make mistakes, and so this beneficial interaction of human society.
causes us to do things that aren't actually in our self-interest, even though it seems like they are. Um, this is in reference to Matthew 16, verse 18 through 19, and chapter 18, 15 through 18. Catholic or Protestant, all Christians believe they have the Holy Spirit to interpret Scripture. Today, who on earth has the final authority to bind and loose doctrines on the Christian faith? In other words, who today has the last word for an interpretation of Scripture or to decide what it really means? Nobody. Nobody has the last word. You are responsible as a thinking human being to read the text for yourself and to interpret fairly. Now, how do you interpret the Bible? The same way you interpret any book here at Texas State. You read in context and you respect literary style. If you were to rip one line out of Shakespeare's Othello and say, that is Shakespeare's worldview, that would be irrational, that would be intellectually dishonest. You have to read the whole thing through and then you interpret based on the context. That is why in Luke chapter 14, when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you hate your father and mother, your wife and children, you do not be my disciple, you better read that in context. You should know that Christ is not calling us to literally hate our family. He's calling us to love him so much that our love for our family pales into hatred when it's compared to our love for our family. It's called hyperbole. It's a legitimate form of communication, an extreme form of speech to make a point. So, you better read in context, and then you better respect literary style. And you better allow a speaker or a writer to use parable, metaphor, historical narrative, allegory, apocalyptic literature. That's how you better interpret. Now, one other thing I would encourage you to do is to pray. And say, Lord, help me to understand what you're trying to communicate. That's obviously highly subjective. All right, no guarantees of objectivity there. But subjectively, cry out, God, if you're there, I want to know you. If you're not, we'll just leave things the way they are. But if you're there, I want to know you. Jesus said, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door shall be opened. So be open. Honestly open, saying, God, if you're there, reveal yourself to me. If not, We'll leave things the way they are. For man and for both. Uh, for both, actually. Uh, in the Gospels, it talks a lot about miracles and how Jesus performs miracles. And my question is that, uh, two, uh, two parts to this question. First part is, how do you define a miracle? And if or if not, if you do or if you do not believe in miracles, how do you justify that with evidence to support your argument? Sure. You want to go first? <coughs> yeah, he's at home. Oh, it's, yeah, okay, it's right. and, and, and I'll give you an example like this. Casting out the demons and sending them to church. Oh, I, I'm very familiar. Uh, Cliff and I have similar backgrounds in that I, I used to act, I was going to be a minister. And so I'm familiar with various miracles. Um, how do I find a miracle? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know if it's a good enough definition, but I would say that by and large, a miracle is an act that violates natural law. Now, the way we use miracle in modern world is completely different. Bus wrecks and everybody survives but one person, and that's a miracle. Somehow it's not a miracle that everybody else died. Um, your, your second question was whether or not I believe in miracles, and why? And I don't. Well, what's the evidence for that? I don't believe in miracles. That's not the same as saying, I believe that miracles don't happen, or I believe that miracles are false. Those are positive claims that I need to support with evidence. I do not believe that miracles occur because I have not seen sufficient evidence that they actually do. This is where the burden of proof comes in. This is why, um, anybody familiar with the OJ trial? I don't know how young you guys are. How many people think he actually did it? <laughs> Well, there was evidence there. There were people who were not convinced. But there are also people who necessarily thought he was innocent. The truth of the claim it has two prongs, true or false. But what you believe about a claim has four prongs, or three. 
And that is, you can believe it's true, you can believe it's false, or you cannot believe either. The not believing is the one that doesn't actually demand a burden of proof. So my own search for miracles did, didn't and don't occur. I just want to see evidence that they actually did before I believe. And belief is not justified one second before the evidence is there to support it. What is a miracle? A miracle is changing of a natural law. Obviously, if there is no supernatural God, it's impossible for miracles to happen. Because if there is no supernatural God, all of reality is matter and energy. It's all there is. So a miracle is the changing of a natural law. It can only happen if there's a supernatural God. That is why it's stupid for an atheist to believe in miracles. Because if there's no supernatural God, no miracles. You and I stand under an apple tree. 100 times out of 100, when an apple detaches from the branch, gravity pulls it to the ground. It hits the ground. 100 times out of 100. But if while you and I are standing under the apple tree, the apple detaches, and our hand reaches out and we catch the apple, then the apple's not going to hit the ground. Why? Because of an introduction of a hand. So what's a miracle? A miracle is a claim that there is a God, a supernatural God, who intervenes and changes a natural law. That is not unreasonable. If there is a supernatural God who created the natural laws in the first place, it is not irrational or unreasonable to believe that he can intervene and change a natural law. But my atheist friends believe in miracles. The only problem is they don't have a miracle worker. They don't have God. What are the miracles that my atheist friends believe in? First of all, my atheist friends believe that life comes from non-life. Friend, that's a miracle. There is no scientific evidence supporting the idea that life comes from non-life. My atheist friends believe in another miracle, that reason comes from non-reason. There is absolutely no evidence that reason comes from non-reason. Reason comes from a rational being, a rational mom and dad or a child. That's how reason comes about. My atheist friends believe in another miracle. Order comes out of chaos by millions of years and chance and natural selection. Friend, that's a miracle. Order coming out of chaos by chance, that's a miracle. The only problem is my atheist friends don't have a miracle worker. Old Testament prophecy to point to the credibility of Christ is because so many of the people that I debate with, that I talk with, don't believe that much of the Old Testament was written before Jesus, or they don't accept that these prophecies really apply to Jesus. So I personally find it a waste of time because the people that I debate with and talk with have such a view of the Old Testament that I wouldn't want to dabble in that. So that's why I don't use it. Okay. Well, you still have a minute if you want to talk a little bit about what the Old Testament prophecy means to you in direct relation to who Christ is. Uh, Come back to the rest of you. You don't have to give it more time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you can have fun. Well, All right, fair that. question. You bet. I'll, I'll go at it. I got a minute and ten seconds to go. All right. In Isaiah chapter 53, we read about a suffering servant. And I think it's rather clear that when you read Isaiah 53, Jesus fulfills that suffering servant motif that the Hebrew prophet Isaiah used in an amazing way. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, you will notice that Matthew, a Jewish man, is trying to show his fellow Jews that indeed Jesus is Messiah. So Matthew shows how Jesus fulfills so many of the Old Testament prophecies. But, to be honest with you, at times it's hard to understand how Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy that Matthew uses. So I don't think it's a watertight issue. I think that because of the way 
Matthew uses prophecy from the Old Testament to point to Jesus. That it's a pretty vague issue, a pretty hard issue. Now, when I'm debating my Jewish friends, often they will say, well, life after death is never talked about in the Old Testament. So this Jesus is about eternal <coughs> life. No, I'm sorry. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, clearly we read about multitudes will live forever and multitudes will die forever. <coughs> Ran out of time. Thanks for asking. So, uh, I guess this is both of it. I, I'll keep it kind of short because I don't think Cliff and I actually depart too much on this subject. Uh, I'm definitely not in the category that thinks that the Old Testament wasn't written before the first century. That's just crazy talk. But I agree. Uh, <laughs> I, and I do agree that uh, Matthew is over, way, way, way over eager to, to make Jesus fill prophecy, including things that many people including Messianic Jews, don't think they're an actual prophecy. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot of interest in it, for the same reason, well, I, I don't, that's not true. I have an interest in all of this stuff. Um, Ten years ago, or 11 years ago, however long ago it was, that I, I ended my studies in pursuit of becoming a minister, um, I didn't stop studying the Bible, or the subjects surrounding Christianity or religion, I didn't think I broadened it a little, so I don't remember all the stuff that I used to know. Um, which is okay, because it doesn't really have an impact on you. You didn't, you didn't hear me tonight bring up biblical contradictions and problems like the, the, the supposed irreconcilability of the various resurrection accounts. Um, we, we could go into that stuff. It doesn't matter to me that much. I'm not bringing it up for kind of the same reason that Cliff is, and that's because at the end of the day, yeah, it'd be neat. If you show there's contradictions, you got all kinds of problems. If you show that maybe there weren't prophecies or didn't fulfill prophecies, you got all kinds of problems. But you don't need to try to debunk the claims of the Bible. The burden of proof is on those claims to begin with. And even if there were no contradictions, no prophecies, and everything in all of the Gospels was considered to be reliably conveyed, the actual substance of the claims is still a category that I cannot find rationally justified simply by somebody saying it out. Hey guys, I uh, appreciate your courtesy of you. Thank you. I'm going to play the heavy here. We're going to have time for two more questions. So we'll take this one and this one. Sorry guys. Um, so the question up here is for Matt. Or for it's uh, for Matt. Okay, so uh, just to be sure, do you believe that there isn't a God because you don't have evidence to prove that there's a God, correct? No. No? What you said was, I believe there isn't a God. That's different from saying, I do not believe there is a God. I realize this is, for some reason, a really sticky widget for some people. I don't know if you... That, that's not my main question, just to okay. be sure. Uh, well, to get to your main question. Sorry. But uh, just to clarify, so from what I understand, your man of philosophy... And uh, I heard you bring up the straw man fallacy. Mm -hmm. So that means that you understand the fallacies. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of the appeal to ignorance fallacy, which is making a conclusion off of the basis of no evidence? Yeah, I mentioned it earlier tonight. I think. So, like, what do you think of that in your beliefs of God? Well, as I said, I'm not asserting that I believe there is no God. If I said, I believe there is no God, just cause, I would be guilty of an argument from ignorance. But I'm not asserting that there is no God. I'm saying I do not believe that God exists because the claim that God exists has not met its burden of proof. That's not a fallacy. It's not any more of a fallacy than saying, I don't believe, and I apologize, the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot or whatever. There are people, living, breathing people right now that you can go talk to who will tell you the story of their alien abduction scenario. These stories are similar, even amongst people who haven't met. These people are sincere. I mean, to the extent that we can identify love and we can identify people lying, these people are not lying. Now, there's a lot of possibilities. Either they're telling the truth, or they're not. Either they're relaying some incident, and they're relaying it incorrectly because they have a delusion, a psychosis, whatever. Or it could be that it's actually real and true. These people believe it's true. I do not believe that it's true. That's not the same as saying I believe it's false. It's not the same as saying I believe they're lying. They have a burden of proof. I do not feel that they've met their burden of proof either. And by and large, the rest of the world agrees with me. 
And yet somehow, when we get to religion, people are eager to shift the burden of proof. I do a weekly TV show, it's a call-in TV show. I cannot tell you how many times people called in and said, prove to me there's no God. I can't, I wouldn't even begin to try. Now, you define your God and you define a logically inconsistent God or a God that directly contradicts observations in reality, okay, we can debunk that. But there is a difference between saying, I do not believe in God, and saying, I believe there are no gods. Now, I only have 10 seconds left. I do not believe there are no gods. Oh, no, I believe there are no gods. Thank you. And we can talk about it afterwards if you want.